This is The Wall Street Skinny, a podcast devoted to exploring the financial services industry and making the world of Wall Street accessible to everyone. Wall Street Skinny. I'm Jen, and I've got Kristen here with me. Hey, Jen. How you doing? I'm good. I'm good. I'm so excited that I finally have like a more appropriate recording setup, although I kind of look like I'm in an insane asylum because everything is white. But at least I have a room that is like brightly lit, and you can see my face, and I look vaguely human today. On Your the last looks very blonde. Video episode. Your hair you know what's funny blonde. is it actually isn't. It isn't. I went darker to get rid of. Guys, you may have, if you are watching our social media videos, you'll see like the evolution of my hair. I had the worst hair cut color job like ever in history in December. And it was the guy just gave me stripes. And when I've never gone back to have my color corrected, Kristen knows this. Kristen is, is a fan of exercising that option. I was always like too afraid to to go back and be like I was unhappy because I didn't oh, want no, to get I judged. Have, I have I have gone back and be like I hate what you did to my hair. <laughs> Fix it, right? Which is honestly, For it. and you talk to most stylists and they're like, I'd rather you did that than just yes. like disappeared, never came back. Which is what well, I would. But, well, yeah, because they they want you to be happy because they also don't want to then not have your business in the they future. They don't want to lose. Exactly. They want to understand what you want. So then the next time you come in, they're like, okay, now I understand it. And then, by the way, now you have a hairstylist. You can like do your hair for life versus he screwed up right. hair. I'm never going back. I'm going to go find somebody new. So I finally exercised that option for the first time. And I went back to the guy and he was like, oh, well, the only way out is through. So he like <laughs> made me even blonder. But it was just it was so bad. And I was like, the only way to combat this is to just let it grow out. So if you look at all our videos in the beginning, I had like a line of hair down to here that was my like gray and brown roots that was just terrible. And so I found someone who tried to just like smooth things out. But now that you're not so like caught off guard by how dark it is, I think it makes everything look blonder by comparison. I don't know. No, it's, it's really it's the lighting. It's I think it's the lighting. It's probably also yeah, just the lighting. lighting. Yeah, now that I'm in like a brightly lit room. <laughs> We were talking about this because I we've had people who will reach out to us. We were asked, which one is Kristen and which one which is Which one's Jen? which? And you I said, know. I, Kristen, am the blonder one and Jen is the less blonde one. So I'm <laughs> contemplating a Lisa Rinna brown wig moment to try to just totally distinguish us and have just don't you know, go the with the Lisa the Rinna haircut. And training. As no, not the feather. Never, the haircut I've is been catching up she, on the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills from last season. I'm so behind. But since I was in the hospital with my kid for so long and he was asleep, I was like, well, I might as well just catch up on some trashy reality TV. And Lisa has this great wig and it's dark brown. I love and her wig. She looks fabulous. Yeah, she, she does. She looks great. By the way, I, I can't stand her as a person, but she is beautiful. I just... When she has the wigs, I'm like, why have you had this awful haircut? Why do you have this feathered years? Or when you and could look like that? I know. And she's had it for her entire career. What's well, her and signature? I, it's like the lips. Because lips will come and go. But she's like, no, right. I've committed to this. And I think the she's committed lips. in the same way to her hair. You know, because again, she committed to the lips long enough. They eventually became the in thing. So now right. she's hoping yeah. that the feathered bob will come back. Um, I am. By the way, I am very comfortable with the idea of plastic surgery. I would get all the plastic surgery in the world if I could. So this is if not, I've had dollars. plastic surgery. Yeah, like I, this is not a knock on plastic surgery at all. But I think the one thing I don't ever intend to do is my lips. Yeah, I just, you know, it's funny, right? Like in Charlotte, the lips are everywhere and they're on 20 year olds. And I don't understand. I'm like, you looked so beautiful. Now you look like a much older woman trying to make herself look younger. It, it's aging them. It's having like the inverse yes. effect yeah. of what it's intended yeah. to. I'm like, yeah. wait till you're old like us. Yeah. And then you yeah. need lips. Well, and, you know, I will say our listeners, we can like get a breakdown of the demographic and it's actually like overwhelmingly men. So they probably do not care about any hey of this. Hey guys. But, but no, it's interesting because- Your husband seems- likes the Real Housewives. He watches it begrudgingly. He's not watching it because he wants to. He's watching it because I turn it on and he's there and he's stuck. Sure, sure. <laughs> he's no, definitely so- skipping that golf outing with his bros to watch The Real Housewives with you begrudgingly. Seriously, um, yes. So on that note, and not yeah. at all on that note, today we are going to be talking about what I will fully confess I always thought was like the most boring part of the industry, but I am shook by how scintillating research sounds after talking Mm -hmm. to our guest that's coming on today. We're going to be talking about research, which on the public 
capital markets side of an investment bank is one of the three pillars of sales, trading, and research. And of all of the facets of the industry that we've discussed, this is the side of an investment bank that Kristen and I have zero experience working in ourselves. So Mm -hmm. rather than lying to you and being like, here's what it's like to be a research analyst at a bank or on the buy side, we're bringing in someone who is not only experienced in that field, but is hands down one of the most accomplished, impressive, knowledgeable people in the research field, period, full stop. We're going to cover everything from what it takes to get into the role of a research analyst to how to become successful as a research analyst, how you get compensated as a research analyst, and then what you do with that career. Yes. Um, Yes. So I think we're going to we're going to run the whole gamut here. And we're really excited. So um, I want to introduce you to who we have today. It is a incredibly special guest. Now, full disclosure, this person also happens to be related to me through marriage. He is my father-in-law's brother or my husband's uncle. I don't think we would have been able to get someone of his caliber if it weren't for that. So we are really excited. We have Steve Haggerty on and Steve is just a incredibly seasoned researcher. And so he has worked on the sell side and the buy side in very senior roles. But I want to back up for a second and just explain why this is such an important episode. So we have so far touched on what is investment banking? What is sales and trading? What is capital markets? What we have not touched on is the research division, because Jen and I didn't actually work. We've in never that worked there. No, we yeah, have so no we know experience exactly there. Exactly what people are doing on a day-to-day basis. I mean, the irony is I've taught people who are going into research, but I still probably couldn't tell you what they do on a day-to-day basis. And so that's why we wanted to have Steve on so that he could explain what the role of research is and what the skills are, the exit opportunities and everything related to that. And so I'm just going to kick this off because Steve, you have just such an incredible resume. Can you give our listeners just a high level overview of your work experience? Sure. First of all, thanks for having me on Christian and Jennifer. I really appreciate it. I think this is a great podcast. I actually thought I got onto this because I was related to you. I thought that's the only way no. you would let me be on it. Oh. Your husband was able- <laughs> neighbor, like, can you, can you put my uncle on this form? The guy doesn't have anything else to do. Would you? So I appreciate it. I think this is a great concept you guys have, and I'm, I'm really thrilled to be part of it. In terms of my background, briefly, like a billion years ago, when dinosaurs still mm-hmm. roamed the earth, I worked at General Motors. Oh. And uh, I leveraged that experience, which involved working in Michigan, but also working in the UK for one of their divisions. I was able to leverage that industry experience to become a uh, financial services auto analyst, a sell side. What were you doing analyst. for GM? Well, it was a lot. I worked there for uh, 10 years. I, I started out working at the time. This was a long time ago. I had noticed the color of my hair. Um, <laughs> it was the age of corporate staff. The view was that if you hired a lot of hardworking, supposedly bright, energetic people, put them together, they would come up with strategic plans that would solve everything. So I was oh, kind of like an analyst involved. class at a bank. It's the same principle. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Unfortunately, it was, we were not that successful given the ongoing track record of General Motors. And then, then I moved to more operational roles. And actually I was in the UK uh-huh. uh, working at one of their divisions. And that was actually at a facility that had manufacturing and, and was you know doing production scheduling. Oh, and then cool. I came back and I did some work in Asia. So it was a combination of strategy with some operational background. But I was able to use that because I felt that what I was doing was analysis, yeah. uh, was research, was capital allocation. I could do that on Wall Street. And I had friends who had worked with me at General Motors and made that transition to Wall Street. And to be perfectly honest, Wall Street at that time was very exciting. It was really becoming more well-known to everybody. The compensation was comparatively better. Mm-hmm. And I was able to say, well, I know a lot about the automotive industry. And why don't you hire me as a research analyst? And I actually became the automotive analyst for European Auto stationed in London. Cool. Wow. I did that for five years and then for a variety of reasons, moved back to the U.S. and became an auto analyst at Merrill Lynch mm-hmm. and also became an industrial analyst there. There was a big merger in 2008, when we had the financial crisis, B of A, Bank of America, bought Merrill Lynch. I stayed there. I became a research manager. In fact, most of my time on Wall Street has been as a research manager. So I managed the Americas Research Department in New York for Merrill Lynch, B of A. I managed the Asia Pacific Research Department in Hong Kong for B of A. And then when I went to the buy side, I was head of research there. So I made the transition from industry to analyst and from analyst to manager. And I think one thing I would say that the unifying theme in these roles, I think, has been a real interest in in economics, a real interest in doing analysis, a real interest in understanding how markets and geopolitics works. And I think these roles that I had 
they're good jobs because you get to touch all of those concepts, all those intellectual areas. And so for me, these have been pretty, pretty cool jobs because I've been able to be involved in different geographies, different asset classes, different groups. I mean, sales, trading, I worked with them too. That's some of your experience, Jennifer. So mm-hmm. people say it's not just about the destination, it's about the journey. But I would say the journey that I had had as a research analyst manager was pretty cool when I, I'm very fortunate to be able to partake in it. Do you think wow. that that is the most common path for people coming into research to come from industry expertise and then leverage that into a role analyzing those industries? No, it's not. Um, it, it seems it rare to me, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or some firm, Bernstein, emphasized it a lot. They really value people who understood the industry and the workage of the industry more than just the financial mechanics around it. You know, the, the yeah. idea that you could do, Chris, do a DCF is great, but if you don't understand the inputs, mm-hmm. you don't understand what's going on, it's not that useful. Um, right. So no, it's not that common. I would say the typical profile for a sell side or a buy side analyst is someone either coming out of undergrad who then goes to get a CFA, a certified financial analyst degree yep. that you can sort of do while you're working, or yep. they have an MBA and they work their way up. And that's great. And you certainly get some really talented people with great financial acumen, but there is, in my view, value to people who have worked in an industry or worked in the corporate environment Uh for a lot of things when you're analyzing assets, whether it's a stock or a bond. Right. I mean, otherwise these are just widgets, right? And how mm -hmm. do these widgets relate to one another versus you who had actually been on the floor seeing how the operations work? Um, One quick question about something you touched on there. We get a lot of questions from our listeners about the CFA and about its utility in our Mm -hmm. industry. And Mm -hmm. not times out of 10, we're saying, hey, for IBD, for sales and trading, for capital markets, it's not necessary. Now, it sounds like it has a lot more utility in the research space. Is that something you can speak to? Sure. I mean, I think there's there's two ways to think about, first of all, say MBA versus CFA. Mm -hmm. Uh, The MBA is expensive because you (laughs) generally are not working and incur a lot of debt. And then when you come back to the job, if you come back to the job that you were in before, you're basically doing the same stuff. So, yeah. but I did speak to someone who did that, who had been at us for a while. And, and he basically said he wanted to understand sort of the academic rigor behind all the stuff he was doing every day. For him, it was important uh-huh. to understand. So he got an MBA. Mm-hmm. I think the CFA is a practical compromise to that. You can continue to work. You have to study a lot while you're yeah. working. I think yeah. it's definitely a valuable thing to have on your resume for for research. Yeah. And for our and listeners who may not know, sorry, CFA stands for Certified Financial Analyst. Um, and and yeah, there are three, three levels. levels. Yep. And yeah, do yeah. most of the people you've seen in research have all three levels or just one or two? Most of them, once they commit, they go through They it. go through I mean, with yeah. the whole if thing. You, okay, got it. If I sold two resumes and one had a CFA and one didn't, I would probably be more favorably disposed, yeah. all the things being equal, uh-huh. to the one with this. Right, because they've shown three years of commitment to get a hard certification. They do learn things in a way that is more rigorous than just picking it up on the streets, you know, having yeah. someone teach mm-hmm. you it while they're doing it. So I, I do think, I do think, and I would say that more and more, even in the disciplines outside of uh, research, more and more people in sales and in trading are just getting that degree to sort of mm-hmm. give them a level set against a lot of the people that they're dealing with on a day-to-day basis. Well, everyone's so overqualified for these jobs relative to what we were coming into the industry yes. that I think any yeah. leg up you can give yourself is certainly well worth it. Right. It's just an interesting little side note here. That that's something that we've always been like, if you want to, but you know, well, it seems bank, like it's definitely a research. A yeah. Research. And I feel like asset management are the two big ones where it's, I it agree. is valued. So we really want to understand high level. <laughs> what is, what is research? Yeah. What, how does it fit into an investment bank? And then what do research analysts actually do? You know, I could probably do a whole series of podcasts yes. on that question. <laughs> we'll bring you back. Don't worry. We'll torture you multiple no, times. Not, so research is basically at a company level. And first of all, research, I'm going to talk about equity research. That's right, what I did, right, which right. means I was looking at single stocks. I was looking at General Motors because I did autos. I was looking at John Deere because I did machinery. But you can be Apple. You can be anything, that NVIDIA, any company that is publicly traded, a equity research analyst can, what they call, cover it, mm-hmm. have it in their coverage universe and offer opinions at, on it. They do a lot of work uh, around that. But ultimately, the idea, whether you're doing it on the sell side or the buy side, is to determine if that equity is mispriced. Mm-hmm. And I can't say that enough because there's about 8 zillion other things people worry about. But ultimately, if you can identify an asset, an equity that is mispriced, meaning its current price is not consistent with its intrinsic value, either in the short term or the long term, that is an opportunity to make money. There's a trade to do. And, 
people forget that. Like it's a mispriced asset. For some reason, it's mispriced or you think it's mispriced and the market doesn't. That's even better because yep. that means you're correct and the rest of the world's wrong. Mm -hmm. But if you can identify an asset that you think is mispriced and you are correct, that's how you make money. All mm -hmm. the other stuff supports that. And I, th I say that in being so emphatic is because people forget that. It's not figuring out necessarily whether it's a beat or a miss on that mm -hmm. quarter's earnings. That's important. Right. You need to determine if you think this asset is mispriced. Now, how does that work out? Well, there's a division within research. There's the buy side mm -hmm. and there's the sell side. The sell side advises. That's their job. They provide advice to, in one case, the buy side. The buy side invests. They allocate capital to those stocks, in my case, mm -hmm. that are mispriced, either too expensive or too cheap. Right. But that's an important distinction. If you don't learn anything else from this podcast, <laughs> You need to know that the sell side advises and the buy side invests. We got it. And Wrap reason, it up. That's it. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> and so the and sell side basically is called the sell side. They are selling ideas. Mm -hmm. The buy side is buying ideas to invest in. So that's the big picture. And as I mentioned, you can be an analyst, a research analyst in equities like I was. You can do it in fixed income, corporates or treasuries. Um, you can do it in foreign exchange, FX. You can do it across a range of different asset classes, but I've specialized in equities, which is typically, if you watch CNBC or one of these shows, they're the talking heads that come on and they talk about equities mm -hmm. all day. Yeah. So it, that's the high level discussion of what they do and what their job is, is identifying these mispriced assets. Now, I would also say that research analysts on the sell side, and again, these, these research analysts are typically parts of big departments. Um, the departments I managed, you know, had over 300 people in them. And that's because you have teams that develop specialized sector knowledge, mm -hmm. again, autos, autos biotech, yeah. and it's their job on the sell side to know everything there is to know about those companies so that you can advise the buy side. But in addition to advising the buy side, if you're embedded in a big bank, which I was, I was part of Bank of America, you could be in Citi, you could be in JP Morgan, you could be in Morgan Stanley, you have a research department, you have a sales and trading desk where I think you work, Jennifer, you were part That's of that me. organization. And, and so those guys all kind of, or those teams all sort of work together. You're embedded in this bigger organization, but it also has an investment banking division. It may, as it does somebody like Morgan Stanley or Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, have a wealth management division that mm -hmm. manages individuals' wealth. Research gives them information too. And then research also does work with the IBD or investment banking division to help companies either raise money or to come public with an IPO. So within a big bank, the research department is serving the wealth management team, the IBD team, and then externally the buy side, which can be institutional investors like Fidelity, mm -hmm. T. Rowe, or hedge funds like Point72 or something like that. So right. that's basically the structure, how it works, and the teams themselves that I talked about. So if you're a sector specialist, it might be a team of three to five individuals with a director or managing director as the senior analyst. Mm -hmm. And then you would have support teams. It could be anywhere from an analyst, an associate, and a vice president. Each team normally covers somewhere between 15 and 25 equities or stocks yeah. in a given sector. That's kind of how the sell side works. I always thought it was funny that the, they were called the analyst, but then it's annoying, I feel like, because then at like the most junior level. Oh, you think like of it analyst. as far as seniority. <laughs> with like little A. And then, but it's like, no, it's like yeah, the analyst. Really. It's like big A. Yeah. So it's um, just big A and little A. Yeah. <laughs> so three things I wanted to follow up on. You talked about the sell side and the buy side, that the buy side is buying this research. I'd love if you could explain exactly how they are paying for that research, exactly how that compensation is conveyed. Are they paying a fee for each paper you write? Is it embedded in then the business that they show the firm? Like, how does all that work? That's question one. That is a very good question, but a really complicated question. Now, I'll tell you why it's complicated. A sell side research department does not have a P&L. They do not get paid a dime mm -hmm. directly for what they produce. That's a function of the security laws that, believe it or not, like 1934, right. that prohibited <laughs> you from profiting from writing research because it was deemed to be a conflict of interest within the bank. Yeah, I, yeah. So what happens is that the research department, first of all, it has no P&L. It is dependent on its resourcing for those internal customers I mentioned, mm -hmm. IBD, wealth management, and sales and trading. They all have to contribute to support the research department. So the way it works in simplest terms, if I'm an analyst and I have just written a report on Tesla, and I go out and I do a lot of marketing, which we'll get to in a minute when we talk about the day, a day in the life of a sell-side analyst. Uh -huh. 
and I go and I have a bunch of meetings. And let's say I have a buy rating because typically my views on whether an asset is mispriced are communicated by either a buy, hold, or sell rating or some. Or as an arrested go, development, don't buy. <laughs> <laughs> so I come and see you, Jennifer, in your office. Um, we talk about Tesla Ooh, and a bunch office. of other names. I leave and you are a portfolio manager or an analyst working on a portfolio team. And you say, I think what Steve Haggerty is saying about Tesla, he wants us to buy it, makes a lot of sense. I'm going to do some of my own work. And maybe a week later, you decide to take a position in your portfolio in Tesla. But because I've helped you with that idea, when it comes time to buy those shares, you're going to buy them on my trading desk through my traders at BMA, my traders. No, no, no. And that's, but yeah. one way, that's one way that they make money. I help the buy side with this idea. And so they come in and they buy a million dollar position in their book in Tesla and some basis points on that million dollars gets accrued to my firm. That is one way that you can get paid. Yeah. Um, there are other ways to get paid depending on the structure of the, of the firm. And I don't want to be too detailed. You could also write hard dollar checks. Mm -hmm. You can in some agencies for the research, but that's for different types of research firms. They're typically not embedded in the big banks. So right. one way that you get paid is by helping buy side firms make these decisions. The buy side has to buy the stock and typically they buy the stock at the firm where the sell side analyst works. There's other services they might avail themselves of too. Something we won't go into this like prime brokerage because mm -hmm. it's at your firm. Another way you can get paid, not directly, and this almost put the whole this out of business back in 99, 2000. As I mentioned, you help IBD bring companies to yep. that market. Yep. You don't get paid for that deal or you'll go to jail. Right. But the fact that you are part of helping IBD bring companies to market through IPOs means IBD will give money to research to support what, what is done. Right. Same with wealth management. If you are helping their financial advisors with information, they will contribute to the kitty. So there is no direct payment for that research. Um, generally, I mean, there are some, you, you can sell it to some people and things like that, but generally it is a business that you produce and because of regulatory issues, you have to get paid indirectly. It's so funny because going back to what you just said, that it, it seems like not letting research get paid almost feels like it does create the conflict of interest because back to your point about IBD, doesn't research feel almost a little bit like they need to be putting buy ratings on things? You know, because it's it's helping the IBD department win business. I remember when I was working in banking, like we couldn't email the research analyst. Like if you wanted to talk yeah. to someone in research, wow. you had to go through compliance. There is something called a Chinese wall in place at these or banks. Or just the wall. Separate private and public information. Yeah. And yeah. if you want to, as someone who has access to material non-public information in the investment banking division, talk to someone on the public side, you have to go through the process of what's going to be called being brought over the wall. And that happens in it, both directions. It's so a good point. Was, I mean, yeah. the whole IBD issue is a very good point. It's, again, what got a lot of banks, including the bank I worked for, Merrill Lynch, in trouble back in 99 and 2000 because it was perceived through an email trail that the analyst rating on the stocks was strictly being driven by IBD revenues. And that's where a lot of things you're talking about were put in place. Bankers could no longer talk directly to analysts without a chaperone. And so, so they tried to disentangle the monetary incentive to be positive about banking deals from the rating. It's still a point of contention on Wall Street, though I think it's monitored. And, but that's true. Again, yeah. it's a strange kind of configuration for sell side research because these people are highly paid. They right. work very hard. They have no direct access to a P&L for the work they do. Right. I mean, the irony is one other thing I remember is a lot of times if someone was taking a company public, one of the main factors for a company choosing to go with a specific bank as the book runner was who was the research analyst. Like that was like a huge yep. thing. So it is kind of crazy that then you wouldn't be directly generating P&L. So I was speaking with someone. I do early stage analysis now as, a, as another part of my life and the person was talking about whether or not this company would ever go public. And they were doing just that person. They were, they were talking about analysts that they would want to be associated with in addition to the bank. Right. And what the person said is you, you date the bank, but you marry the analyst. Oh, and I love that. Bankers will go away, but the analyst is going to continue to cover your company when it goes public. And so you're right. The analyst is a critical decision yeah. in a company deciding which banks to use when they go public, even though. They cannot be paid directly for doing that. Right. So there's all these yeah. intangibles that research is contributing and getting paid for. Two follow-up questions to that. What happens when you're wrong? 
because as much as I like to assume that we are 100% right all the time, you know, if there was right. ever one instance where you may have been wrong, obviously there's concrete P&L consequences for whoever traded off that information. How does that come back in any way, shape or form, or does it to you as far sure. as like your reputation as an analyst? And this second part, which I think is embedded in that somewhat, we did an episode earlier with someone named Mo Shununu, who his job is analyzing the news and breaking that down in digestible nuggets for the public. You as an analyst, you have to be the person who is taking all the information out there about this company. And there might be 25 versions of you all across the street. How do you have an asymmetry of information how do you determine that that one stock is mispriced relative to everyone else? Right. So on the sell side, everybody's wrong all the time. In fact, let me I'll give you, this is an actual statistic computed by a consulting firm called Alpha Theory that helps buy side firms optimize their portfolio. Mm -hmm. Only 50% of the stocks in a portfolio manager's portfolio move in the direction you're supposed to. I mean, long Only 50? I'm hoping you'd say it was 51. No, they're wrong 50% of the time, right so off the bat. That's a quick man. Are, they're right off the bat. That's the buy side. They're wrong. The difference, though, between being wrong on the sell side, the advisory side, versus the buy side, the investing side, is you're not actually putting any money at risk on the sell side, right? I mean, you're not. It's a great job. And that's why if being right <laughs> required for the sell side, they, they'd all be out of business. They get by providing advice or they provide service, or they provide content, or sometimes they go golfing. They do a lot of things. But being right is not the majority of what they do. So without going into too much more detail, if you really break down the sell-side analyst job into three factors, they inform, they advise, and they facilitate. What's informing? Well, I just went to a company's a capital markets day, and this is what they talked about. And I thought the CEO was a little bit different this time when she spoke about the strategic plan versus last time. All that kind of stuff. It's newsy. Mm -hmm. In some ways, it's like a gossip columnist. I but love that. But people want promotion because the buy side can't go to all these meetings. They're busy. And so they rely on the sell side for information. You know, they rely, hey, the, the company reported earnings. They missed by two cents. Blah, blah, blah. That's, that's information. The advice part I just talked about, which is helping the buy side allocate money to stocks. And facilitate is the sell side has great relationships with corporates, with the C-suite, CEO, mm -hmm. CFO, COO because they follow these companies. They know them. Best sell side analysts, and this comes back to your second question a little bit um, about how they get an edge. They may have been covering these companies for 20 years. And so they know they know where all the skeletons are. They know all the bad deals these CEOs have done. They've been there before the current CEO was, was in their seat. Right. And so that facilitation, that organization, hey, I can get you a one-on-one -on -one with the CEO at my conference, or I'm going to bring this CEO to your office on a non-deal roadshow. Those are other services that you provide as a sell-side analyst that makes you valuable, even though most of the time your stock picks are going to be wrong. Got it. Yeah. And now who's courting side, whom in that relationship? Is the C-suite of that corporation courting the analyst or is the, because they're the client of the firm on the IBD side, who is the client in that scenario? Yeah. I mean, I guess, I don't know whether it's courting or incestuous, but there's some, there is a, <laughs> it's a very complicated, it's both. It is mm. both. I mean, the sell side needs access to the corporates want to do their job and to bring them to the buy side. Corporates want the sell side to have positive views sure, on their right. company. They go ballistic if a hedge fund puts a short, a sell a rating mm -hmm. on their name, even if a sell side analyst does that or a hedge fund has a short position. Right. So it's complicated. And so there's a back and forth and it's kind of a tightrope that you have to try to walk to show I'm still independent, but I still have great access. But on the uh -huh. buy side, you have to be right. You get paid to be right. And that's why being right, you will not survive as a buy side portfolio manager if you're wrong all the time. You just won't because you're not making anybody any money and nobody will pay, give you money to lose it. So right. it is a much bigger deal. Right. And over time, if you're wrong a lot on the buy side, you'll either have to change jobs a lot until you eventually just get kicked out of the industry. So being right matters for the buy side. It's not as important for the sell side. Thank you. That yeah. was an excellent answer to that question. I really appreciate it. <laughs> How common is it for someone on the sell side, a research analyst on the sell side to go to the buy side? I know obviously you did. Do most research analysts on the buy side, do they come from sell side research? Right. I think a lot are coming from IBD, but how easy is it to go to the buy side? And actually, I would say, is someone who's good on the sell side, will they be good on the buy side? Or is it the same right. set of skill set? So in the old days, it used to be that you would work on the sell side for a while, and then maybe towards late, later stages of your career, 
you would transfer to a, a sort of a sleepy long only, like a big mutual fund manager. Yep. And you get, wouldn't get paid as much as you did on the sell side because there wasn't things like banking that augment your income. Mm -hmm. And it was a good way to sort of have a, a role based on what you understood and knew and still be involved in uh, helping with the investment process. That's kind of changed, especially with hedge funds. Hedge funds typically will not hire a sell side analyst if they've been in their role for more than three or four years because they feel that their brains have been so converted to this sell side way of being very marketing oriented and not necessarily thinking about not so worried about being right <laughs> yes and it's it's not that easy a lot of hedge funds would say we don't want you if you've been there for more than a couple of years that is fantastic color i did not know that yeah that's so interesting now so i was able to make that transition for a couple of different reasons one i made the transition as a head of research mm -hmm. because i was a head of research on the sell side so there was a certain transferable head of research skills that necessarily weren't tainted or corrupted on the sell side because you can still bring those skills over. I also went to a hedge fund that was specializing in emerging markets. So markets outside of say North America and Europe. And I had worked in Hong Kong. So I had a lot of experience in emerging markets in Asia. So I had a unique experience set that made me more attractive to this firm. Right. But, you know, it wasn't easy. I mean, it wasn't easy to necessarily go from the role I had to the role I then had on the buy side. So I guess I'd say it's not as common Mm -hmm. It's not, it's very uncommon. It does happen. It's right. pretty uncommon for a sell side analyst to go become a portfolio manager at a hedge fund. They just, they really don't think your skill set is applicable and therefore they don't think there's going to be success. Doesn't mean it can happen. But right. what you see now is sell side analyst jobs at these big firms are pretty good jobs. They pay yeah. well. You can get processed down and you can have a 20, 25, 30 year career doing it and make a yeah. good living. So there's not as much input that you have to jump over to the, the buy side yeah. anymore. It's funny because I think nowadays a lot of people that go into financial services or go into investment banking or want to go into whether it's sales and trading, investment banking, whatever, they're kind of always looking for like, what's the next thing? I do think it's it's worth noting, like you're probably not going to go into a sell side research role and then come out and go to the buy side. But again, it is a fantastic career and yeah, you don't always have career. to be going for the next job. So it can happen. Um, I think it's even rarer for someone to go, say, from the sell side in a, in a big bank, they jump over to banking. That's rare too. Yeah. For sort of other main reasons. You've never done a deal. You've been working in financial services for 10 years. You've never actually done a deal. It's like, oh, we don't, we don't need you. You know, you go yeah. back to research. So I would say that the sell side job is, I wouldn't say it's not possible, but if you've been there for a while and you're the analyst with a capital A, as you said, you're the senior leader, yep. you know, your, your ability to transfer into other roles on Wall Street becomes, I'd say it declines over time with your tenure. Well, I think that's also I mean, culturally something that's shifted in how people view their jobs, right? I mean, we talk about the olden days, but I think it used to be the goal was to go to whatever kind of corporation it was, whether it's the financial services or outside the financial services, and work your way up through the organization. And the right. dream was always like, I will one day be the CEO of Morgan yep. Stanley or whatever it may be. <laughs> I think now we are much more culturally in an era of less loyalty to companies, less thoughts for longevity within that company and more, well, what does this get me next? What is the next yeah. thing that I can propel to? What is that quick fix? Yep, Certainly with research, it's more of that old school model. That's definitely what happens a lot of the time in sales and trading, right? People in sales and trading go on to whether or not that was their original intent. Maybe they thought they were going to be some hotshot hedge fund trader. And then they're like, this is great. I work at a bank where even if I have a bad year, I still get paid. <laughs> not so bad and that, <laughs> right that's a, that's that's the hedge fund didn't good. blow up yeah right. yeah i mean there's there's two great insights there jennifer that you made and one thing i want to say is another exit strategy though that i've seen more often recently for sell side analysts is to go to corporates and go, go to, to the corporate you cover right i mean you yeah. came from gm to the business yeah. i would imagine that if you've been covering and talking to and obsessed with gm yeah. for the past 20 years of your career you could go in and run corporate strategy because you probably yeah, know or, better or, than they do. You're lovely for uh, investor relations, right? Because oh, you yeah. were the person. You know, right. So I know more than a handful of my former colleagues are now investor relations people who then got into treasury and then mm -hmm. maybe got more involved in the financial part of it overall. Um, and then I think you're right that the loyalty in, in what you want to do is change radically from even my generation, but certainly before my generation, people would work for a company the whole time. And now I think People are looking for, well, what's next? And particularly mm -hmm. if there's something hot. Like, for example, when I was leaving the hedge fund I was working, I noticed that some of the institutional salespeople who covered my firm were disappearing because they were going to join Bitcoin firms, yep. right? So that was yep. firm, yep. attracting mm -hmm. talent. And I think the other area where you see people go now 
is even we're not we even touched on this as an area where there are researchers too is private equity yeah. because they they have a like massive research departments and investment departments yeah. or an area where they're trying to do some work in you know early stage venture capital venture they, capital they also, sure and those are areas that are probably a little bit more dynamic than the institutional research departments that I came from um, they can be financially rewarding and you know there's a lot going on where you're figuring out stuff that nobody else has figured out. Which makes sense because there is so much more you need to do if you are a research analyst to understand the industry versus, again, as a banker, you're like, well, I'm just going to take what the research analyst says and then I put it into my model and, you know, there we right. go. Whereas the research analyst has to like, figure out, well, what do the projections look like? Dave, yeah. can you yeah. ask a really sense. dumb question? We've talked so much about all of this in the context of public companies. Now- mm -hmm. On the buy side, in those private equity and venture capital roles, obviously you are looking at companies oftentimes that are not public or companies that you have taken from being public and now privatized. Um, mm -hmm. How do buy side analysts get that information about companies that are not yet public, about private companies? I'm not sure I'm 100% the best person to answer that, but I will tell you how I've experienced it recently. So there's one big overarching factor. I'm going to become an economist for a second because actually my real dream in my life right now is I was supposed to be head of the Federal Reserve, but it didn't work out for me. <laughs> um, please apply for the job. job. We'd love to have you. I think you would do I still have this, I still have this desire to play economist from time to time. Mm -hmm. So we all know rates have gone up a lot from very, very low what? annual level. <laughs> but that has shifted the outlook for what returns might be in public equity markets. They're probably not going to be as high for the next 10 years as they were for the last 15. Kristen, if you're teaching some of the DCF and the denominator gets a lot bigger, Mm -hmm. And that DCF, that means that the, the return on the stock is going to be yep. lower. So there's more interest in finding other uh, ways to generate returns. If you're an endowment and you have a target of generating five, six, seven, eight percent a year, and you're not going to get that out of equity markets anymore because of the rate environment, you look in other places. And one of the places you look are non-public investments, alternative investments, right? And so I, what you're seeing is that some of these big institutional investment houses, like a Fidelity, like a Wellington, like a T. Rowe, they have uh, non-public research teams. And I'll give you an example of how this works. The non-public research team might specialize in a sector and they will be going to conferences. I mean, I just went to a conference in California three weeks ago that was all about startups and ag tech. They may go to a conference like that. They may listen to the companies. They may think the founder sounds pretty articulate. They may think the product or the science is pretty compelling. They'll go back to say one of these big institutional investors. They'll walk across the hallway to the person who is the expert in that sector, let's say it's agriculture, public uh -huh. agriculture. And we'll say to this person who has 25 years of experience following agriculture companies, I just sold this startup that has a widget that does whatever. Uh, lab grown you meat, whatever. Makes, yeah. You think that makes sense? And if the portfolio manager with years of experience says, yeah, that's a, that's a problem that needs to be solved. This person who's specializing in the startups will say, okay, come with me to this meeting. Mm. And they'll go to the meeting and then they'll hear the pitch. And eventually, after a lot of due diligence, they will take money from a mutual fund, the same mutual funds that the public stocks are in, and put it into a private stock, a, a non-public company, a startup. The idea being they get in early, they know everything about the company. If the company goes public, it just transfers from a preferred to an equity in that mutual fund. Mm -hmm. So my point is, there's a lot of work being done because returns are seen as potentially being better in non-public equity mm -hmm. than public equity that a lot of these big research houses are developing non-public research analysts. There's also, and in biotech, there's a lot of what they call crossover funds, mm -hmm. which are public and private in the same fund. That's kind of what I'm talking about at some of these big institutions. So my answer to your question is, I think it was harder to do in the past, at least structurally, these buy-side firms are developing a sleeve of analytical capacity to identify analyze and potentially make an early stage investment that eventually becomes a public company in their big funds. So cool. Wow. We were talking yeah. about that asymmetry of information earlier. I had no idea that there were so many resources being devoted to this on the buy side in institutions that we yeah. think of as being much more traditional, right? In, their, in the yeah. scope of their investments. I wouldn't say it's nowhere near the institutional resources they have or the resources dedicated to institutional investing, but it's there. And my view is it's going to grow because of the fact yeah. that more focus is on these stage companies to get better returns. Right. Wow. And again, in an environment where interest rates are no longer zero, everyone who had been going, OK, private equity is so easy. All we need is this big pile of money and we're just going to LBO this company. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. a much more interesting way to approach it from you know the standpoint of one of these big real money guys.
that is all very cool. Okay, so another extremely dumb question. Can you walk us through what an actual day in the life of someone in research is like? Because sure. I truly have no idea. Sure. Let me, again, stick with the cell side yes. side of it first. My view into the cell side analyst is part management consultant because uh-huh. they have to understand the trends in the industry, the regulatory issues, the pricing issues, the competition. Part accountant because they have to take that view of the industry and the companies and translate it into some financial language that can be used to communicate about the company and compare companies. An economist because they have to take all that information and forecast it forward. Uh-huh. A journalist, uh-huh. they have to write about these companies and mm. talk about these companies. And finally, they have to have the spirit of a marathoner because they have to do it over and yeah. over and over. Mm. They get on plane. They have to fly to Kansas City and talk to you know investors there. They have to fly out to San Diego. They have to fly out to Boston. And, and their job as advisors is to constantly be communicating this information that they have over and over. And the core of it, going back to when you asked Jennifer about being right, the basic message that they have to deliver over and over and over again is, I know something that the rest of the world doesn't know, but if you listen to me, you will make money. It's the correct non-consensus view. Mm. And that's what they're telling people. And it takes a big ego to walk into a room of fairly senior portfolio confidence, managers. Confidence, confidence. You need to listen to what I'm going to tell you because if you don't listen to me, you're going to miss out on an opportunity to make money. So that's, that's kind of the detail. That's what they do. So how does that get done? Well, typically the sell side analyst day begins with something called the morning call, which I want to make point. The idea of the morning call and the squawk box came from Wall Street. It did not come from CNBC. That's right. <laughs> Taking these terms and act like they're insiders. But the squawk box, literally, when I first started, because it was well before we had the technology like this, was this little plastic box with a gray front that the morning call came out of. And it squawked because the technology. We called there. it the hoot by the time I was there. The hoot. That's right. So that you, you, but the day typically begins with. The morning call starts at 7.15 generally, and analysts is assigned anywhere from three to four minutes to pitch what is their most important idea that day, typically to the sales force. And then the sales force will go out to the buy side because they cover the buy side with the research analysts and say, hey, uh, Jennifer just was on to talk about this idea. I think it really sounds good. Here are the points of it. Boom, boom, boom. Do you want a meeting with her? Do you want to talk to her? I think you should talk to her because this is in your portfolio and she agrees with you or this isn't in your portfolio where it should be. So that's that's the engine that starts things going. And then when they're not doing that, which lasts a small portion of the morning, they are either scheduling, as I said, to go out and meet clients or talk to them on the phone. I know meetings kind of fell apart during COVID. They're responding to emails. They're responding to requests about the research reports they've either just written or they're working on the next research report that they want to write. Maybe it's a new stock they haven't covered before, or it's an update on an existing stock that they are already covering. Maybe they're changing the rating. Underlying the writing of those research notes is a lot of financial modeling in Excel. You know this very well, Kristen, linked financial statements, a balance sheet, a cash flow, and an income statement. They've got to maintain them. And it's almost, it's a requirement anymore. It wasn't when I first started that you have to have a functioning linked financial statement for every company you cover. So maintaining those detailed, companies with quarterly earnings and multiple yeah, years of mm-hmm. and history is time consuming. Oh yeah. You know I mean, that. the quarterly is what is really tough. As an investment banking analyst, like your life is a lot easier. You're usually only doing annual and you just steal all the assumptions from the research. I was going to say, uh-huh. are you, because you've talked about building all these models all these times in the investment banking division, Christian, why don't you just poach what research has? No, no, that's where they get all the assumptions. It, it's, it's hard to build a quarterly The model. emperor I mean, has no just, clothes with banking. It's all in research, man. Now I'm convinced. I feel like if you are piggybacking off the genius and the sweat in the (laughs) research department. The the bankers typically have more optimistic assumptions because they're trying to convince the company to get a (laughs) revaluation. And I used to always say to the bankers, I said, you guys never modeled thing below the EBITDA line. I'm not trying to say like too much inside baseball, but they never had all the other details. They're like, EBITDA, it's two turns to EBITDA, boom, that's a great stock. That's all they ever did. So (laughs) I'm in your camp. I think banking took all of their intellectual content from from research. They do. So the research analysts are busy, writing reports, keeping the models up to date, communicating their views either in person or by telephony of some sort to their clients and to sales. <laughs> so the typical day, if you're on the morning call, you talk about a company, then you go up to your office and you spend time following up on that company that you've spoken about. You see what else is going on. You look at your you scheduled trips you're going to go to. You typically have a big conference as part of your overall suite of products that may occur once or twice a year, a conference mm-hmm. is where you call in all those shits from the C-suite, mm-hmm. the CEOs, the CFOs that you know, 
you get all these companies in one location, which is a powerful tool for the buy side because sure. buy side can go to one location for one day and see 20 corporates and have 15 one-on-ones. The post you get that CEO drunk and get all the information, you're going to be golden. <laughs> That's My another goodness. way to do it. <laughs> and then, you know, in earnings season, analysts have to stay late to write these earnings reports, but typically when earnings come out and you have a rating on it, you have to have your opinion right away. In fact, mm -hmm. you want your opinion to be the first one that people read. So there's a lot of um, maintenance work, keeping yeah. things up to date. There's a lot of information and there's a lot of facilitation. So if you go back to my three sleeves of information, advisory, facilitation, there's a lot of work around maintaining yeah. that information flow. Yeah. Um, there probably should be more time spent on the advisory part, which is allocating capital. And there's a lot of time spent on just logistics around facilitation. Yeah. It's interesting Actually, because I had no idea in 20 years that there was so much intersectionality, though, between what research does and what sales does, because you are maintaining relationships so much absolutely. at the research yeah. side. And this until now was totally lost on me. And this may differ somewhat between fixed income research and equities research. Yeah, it is different. But typically, you know, a sell side analyst is a company on these marketing trips with someone from sales. They would, sure. When I would go marketing, the analyst would come in with the salesperson that covered it that account. Or when mm -hmm. I was on the buy side, we would have analysts come in with the person from JP Morgan or Morgan Stanley or B of A that covered us. And you develop a deep relationship with these salespeople, mm -hmm. even more so than the individual analyst. Interesting. Wow. I have one quick question. How do you decide what stocks to actually cover? I mean, obviously, if the firm you're at has Whatever taken- Whatever the banker's saying. Well, no, because yeah. if- I'm just well, kidding. Well, because if the firm you're at has I'm taken a company public, then I assume they will start to cover them there. But like, how would you decide I want to start covering mm -hmm. some other company or would you ever decide sure. that? Sure. Sure. Yes. So if you go back to the organization of research departments, you have the big organizations of a couple hundred people. And I said they're organized around sectors, which are basically general industry classifications, yeah. GICs, the, the commerce department definitions, <laughs> autos, machinery, insurance. And then once you get that general idea about what the companies are in that category, you're probably not going to cover them all because you only have so much capacity. So let's leave IPOs out of the discussion for a minute. You're going to cover the largest market cap, most liquid names, because that's how your firm can make money trading those names, right? Got it. If you have, a, you know, a 700 billion or a trillion dollar market capitalization, it's just the price times the number of shares outstanding. I know yep. you guys know that, but I'm trying to. No, yep. please. Sure market value, this is what we do market here. value of the equity. Yeah. Yes. Not using, um, not using too much jargon. So it's interesting. I'll give you a real world example. When I was working in Asia, you had a lot of companies with smaller market capitalizations. It's the nature of the markets over there. The U.S. is the largest, most robust market. And so if an analyst came out and said, oh, I've just upgraded my rating on a Chinese noodle company and the market cap is 150 million, then they say, well, Think about that. Who can buy 150 million market? If I'm a if I'm a fund, and you know I've got like a couple billion dollars, you know what I mean, yeah. like or whatever or more, or even in, within that fund, I can't even get into this stock because yeah. the time for me position that is meaningful to my portfolio, I either have to buy the whole company, right. or I move price so much to try to get into it that I destroy any value. Or so God forbid you try to short it. <laughs> yes, it's that it's impossible. So basically, the decision usually starts from the biggest, most liquid companies and works your way down. Um, that's why small cap companies look for coverage often, not at the biggest banks. They go to more boutique firms to find somebody who will take the time to cover them. Got it. Well, it doesn't mean that the small market cap company can't be a great stock. It definitely can, particularly if it's not as well covered. So there might be information that's not as well known. Yeah. And so there's, you know, hidden alpha in that name. But typically it, it's a question of the GICs, the global industry classification defines a sector. Within the sector, you typically focus on larger market cap. Um, and and liquidity, and that's how it works. It. And then from there down, as you said, a banker, if you work with banking and you at a company, then that's going to be added to your coverage too. And Got typically it. these things pan out between 15 and say 25 stocks for a team of total team size of say three to four people because you just run out of capacity to cover it. You basically want to have a ratio of six stocks per team member. Got it. And what about and so in the world of like meme stocks? Like when you've got like a GameStop <laughs> or something like that, and it's, let's say it's a stock that doesn't have dedicated coverage on the sell side. Yeah. Would you then allocate someone and be like, you got to get up to speed because everyone's going to be asking about GameStop or would you just be like, sorry, that's for No, I mean, I, I mean it depends, right? There were people, some very sophisticated uh, buy side hedge funds that got blown up on yep. these stocks, yeah. right? They yeah. weren't 
weren't just people sitting in a folding chair in their basement. It was the people sitting in the folding chair who took him down. Exactly right. So once it becomes a meme stock, I would not even, I would touch it with a 10 foot pole. Right. Well, because the fundamentals are not supporting the valuation. It's literally just a bunch of people supply and demand. And it's like fully taken off for that. That's where the salesperson has to come in and be like, okay, this is what's going on, guys. I'm not a research analyst, but I can tell you what the price action is and why this is insane. Right. Right. That's right. And, and the, the research view is far less valuable for those types of companies than the trader's view or the salesperson's view. Yeah. Um, right. Because it's right. You're not, you know, I said, I, I was talking all this lofty, high fluid stuff about mispriced assets right, versus right, the right. intrinsic value. Forget it. None of that stuff <laughs> <Yeah>. applies. <laughs> right. To the right. Stocks that you're talking about. I mean, the worst, I'll tell you, the worst situation I saw this happen were where you had sell side firms who were covering a meme stock. Mm-hmm. The analysts say had a, God forbid, a, an underweight on it because it was some little small stock that no one right. cared about. I mean, ricochets up 150%. And now they're sitting there and they go, oh my God, the stock's up 150%. And I have an underweight on it. I don't know what to do with it. And, and, and then the next day it drops 70%. Typically what you'll see is that research managers will come over the top, the people used to be in my role and say, put this thing, take the rating off this thing and put it on a list of you know, it's no rating. We don't, it's not trading on fundamentals. It's a no rating. Leave it off to the side until we figure it out. Because you have no concept of what you're talking about this stock because people in folding chairs are determining the price action. Right. And so yes. just to be clear, what you are doing in your job is always about the fundamentals and never about the price action. Yeah. Well, no, I mean that, no, because you'll get yelled at by sales or by trading. Um, or some you, you need to be able to know the price action on any given day. In fact, I used to, when I was a manager, I would call up, one of the analysts working with me and saying, hey, what's going on with stock X today? Like, what's going on? And if they couldn't answer, I'd say, how can you not answer that question? You cover this mm-hmm. stock. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes the wise guy answer would be, oh, I think there's more buyers than sellers. That would be <laughs> the answer that I would. Like, thanks. That's like so, the best that's I could good. do in sales. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, you have to pay attention to the price yeah. action because you're going to get asked about it. I think mm-hmm. the question is, how responsive do you want to be to the price action in your fundamental view? Right. If the price action is telling you something that is different than your fundamental view, then you should take a look at it and say, maybe my fundamental view needs to be revised or even right. abandoned. And that price action is important, very important near-term mm-hmm. information. What you don't necessarily want to be is it's up. Oh, okay, then I'm going to buy it. Yeah. That, mm-hmm. Then you will lose all credibility with sales. You will lose all credibility with clients. You're just, basically, you're just a trend chaser at that point. You guys are the voice of reason, keeping everybody sane and tying it back to the fundamentals where everybody else is getting all spun up about whatever's happening intraday. That makes a lot of sense. I'll just say price action. We didn't talk about this, but you know, when I was on the buy side, um, we didn't talk about trading at all, and I'm not a trader, but the importance of that price action to a portfolio manager getting in or out of a position is gigantic Mm -hmm. because if they're trying to get out of a position, Let's say they've decided for whatever reason, and, and it's taking the trader a while to find the liquidity to do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And while that's happening, the price is going down. The portfolio manager is saying, my performance is being eroded mm-hmm. by your inability to trade. That's costing me money this done. And that, that interaction between I no longer want to own this stock or I want to own this stock and getting the actual stock in the book is gigantic. I mean, it could determine really whether a, a position is valuable or not. And so I was going to say the price action is absolutely critical to the ultimate performance of the stock. Sure. But that's sort of done in a different environment with the working with the traders. I mean, I've, I've seen portfolio managers standing over the trader's shoulder saying, get that, hit that yeah. bid, hit that, hit that, get, get out of this. So there's a, that's critical. It's just, it's not under the control. It's not what research does. Yeah. Of the research, yeah. <laughs> No, right. absolutely. No, that makes complete sense. So, so for our is, listeners um, who've been like galvanized by this and who are now all excited about research, I've never been as excited about research as I am after this conversation in 20 years. If they are thinking about starting their career, what kind of attributes, aside from potentially like the CFA, MBA that you talked about, yeah. what kind of attributes do you think serve someone who is looking to get into research? Sure. It's a, it's a good question. I mean, I think um, a couple of things. And I, I sort of described some of the attributes, you know, being politician and a marathoner, but be, in a more base level, Jennifer, I think it comes down to, it's an overused term, but you do really have to be intellectually curious. Your mm-hmm. job every day is to find something else about a company that other people have overlooked mm-hmm. or don't understand. And you've got to be willing to sort of pursue that. And there's a certain academic aspect to that, right? You, I mean, it is the term researcher, right? We think of academics doing research. It really is trying to find something out that nobody else knows. So I think you have to be intellectually curious. I think you have to like 
to do, you know, real painstaking analysis. Often you have to be numerate, you have to be comfortable with numbers because you're not going to be able to do this stuff if you don't like to work with numbers. You don't have to be a PhD in mathematics. And some, some of the firms you do, but not there are generally. A lot, you, know. yeah. you have to be comfortable with numbers. I think you have to be comfortable with communicating your You have to focus on communication. You cannot be a really poor communicator and be a successful sell side research analyst because that's such a big part, part of your job. Yeah. And, and I think overall, you know, you have to sort of like market. So let me give you an example. I have arguments with people who maybe don't think Wall Street's the greatest thing in the world. What? And I say to them, my God, I said, do you know what a great advantage it is for the United States to have the most liquid, robust capital markets in the world, both public and private? So why do you think the United States is an innovator? Because innovators get access to capital in this country. They don't have to go to some giant bank and say, uh, can you give me a loan? I or want to the government, the depending on the country yeah. you're in. Right. So the capital markets are not only interesting, and in the U.S. they're so well-developed, they are a strategic advantage. And I'm not some like not, uh, uber capitalist, but I don't think people appreciate how great and how interesting capital markets are in this country. And because of access to capital, companies are able to thrive, adjust, move into new product areas. Or like I said, you know, in my view, it's no coincidence that companies like Apple and Facebook and Intel exist in the U.S. and don't exist in other countries in the world. It's because right. of the unbelievable capital markets we have. And so for me, I have a background in economics, being part of that flow, that process, that evolution is absolutely fascinating to me. And it gets me excited every day, I never did, to be part of those markets. Well, I'll give you one other example. I remember when I had a company under coverage and some information came out and I got that information first. And like you said, you know, use the hoop, use the squawk <laughs> box. I would get on the squawk box down to the trading floor and I'd say, this information on this company that I have a buy just came out. This is consistent with my buy thesis. It's not in the public domain complete. It's public information, but not everybody's looked at this yet. This reinforces my buy. Hang up. And I would sit there and I look at my Bloomberg screen and all of a sudden I'd start to see the price tick up. Oh, that's so cool. I'd say, oh my God, this is fascinating. <laughs> I just didn't flow market, right? Yeah. And that is, that's really cool. I mean, that's yeah. an that's amazing experience to think that your view is now convincing people that they should allocate their capital in some way. So yeah. I think those are the types of things that have to motivate you if you want to be in this research business. It's not as glamorous as banking. Um, it's not as hurly burly as being a trader. It's a little bit more secluded. Mm -hmm. But if you have those characteristics of intellectual curiosity, maybe a little academic bent, good communication skills, and a certain amount of, you said self-confidence, I'll say ego. It's a great, it's a great career. Yeah. I love that. That was awesome. I, I'd like to make, I'll make one more point for running out of time because I think this is something that Jennifer or, or Kristen had asked in her questions. What happens to research going forward, right? Mm. What does it look like for the next version of me that you guys are interviewing? I'm glad you remember our questions when we don't. <laughs> when you're doing these podcasts 20 years from now, the two of you, <laughs> and it's a big deal. And I'll tell you why it's a big deal. What I'm going to mention is when I first got in the, in the business, and I think your, your other podcast colleague, Moshe, talked about this, how President Kennedy was assassinated. There was one phone in both the UPI and the AP were trying to get to it. Whoever got to the phone first had the story. Mm -hmm. Well, roll forward to the 1990s or late 80s. And if you covered General Motors and you were in New York City, on earnings day, if you went to the General Motors building at 59th and 5th and stood in the lobby, you could get the earnings release handed to you. Oh, wow. Right? You had it. And you could run back to the office and you could start analyzing it and talking to people. But if you didn't have that, if you waited for someone to fax it to you because you were in another city, like or God it. forbid they mailed it to you. <laughs> yeah, imagine getting an earnings release mailed to you, right? So the point is there was information arbitrage when I first got in this business. You had an advantage and you just had the information first. That got obliterated because Bloomberg came and Faxit came and eventually the email came and internet came. And so just being the first person with the information was no longer a competitive advantage. And what sell side analysts translate into, they built better models, linked financial statements that are better now. They, they started having big conferences where they brought all these thought leaders together and they could be at the center of that. They started having conference calls with experts. They moved their competitive edge to a slightly different information set. Yeah. Um, but what's happening now and what's happened the last five years is the cost of computer processing has collapsed. Mm -hmm. Unstructured data sets have become available. Mm -hmm. And the tools to look at these unstructured data sets are becoming pretty prevalent. Tools like Python, a coding, mm -hmm. a coding tool. 
And so a friend of mine who teaches at Columbia Business School, Harry Mameski, who you should do a podcast with, he's head of a business program. Um, if only we had someone great, who could get him on here. <laughs> he has a great presentation where he basically said, this is how a stock market analysis has been done since the 1950s. These are the strengths and weaknesses of it. The gaps in that model, which have been identified, are now being filled with this new information that's coming from massive amounts of processing power, growing data sets, and the ability to access it with tools like Python. And so what's happening is people are building models that use large language models, machine learning. You've heard all these buzzwords. Yeah. He actually just launched his own What is large language? Large language is basically taking uh, a robot and feeding like 8 million cell side research reports to it to read. You train the, you train the robot to understand. So that's why this robot now will begin to say, if you feed it new information Buy and say stock. what's gonna happen, yeah. I've, I've read, I have the world's largest database of wow. equity research yeah. reports on this, this topic. Boom, I can tell you what's gonna happen. Wow. So that's what large language models should sort of underlie AI. But my point is what he's saying, and he just launched his own fund called Quant Street, where he's using these tools to come up with asset allocation. Not, it's not a quant, it's a quant hybrid with a human oversight. But my point is that that's gonna be a big deal for sell-side analysts because yeah. writing quarterly ERC reports is gonna be obliterated by yeah. technology, mm -hmm. like shot GPTI. And if you don't have the ability to access some of this information, which again is, it's the equivalent of having the GM earnings report, right? right. Mm -hmm. Nobody else had. But you have to have certain skills. You have to know what Python is. You have yeah. to know, be able to do that. Now, it's like not knowing Excel, mm -hmm. right? If you didn't know Excel, you'd be like, oh my God. That's, and so there's a shift coming where new information is going to be available that will help the decision process around investing. And as a sell side analyst, if you can't participate in that, you're going to be left in the dust. And so that's a big wow. thing coming over the next 10 to 15 years. Um, if you get Harry on, he'll explain it to you much better than I do. But it's a, it's a big deal where it goes yeah. to the information of the type of things Moshe was talking about, where mm -hmm. Will be information asymmetries again, and the idea that the one person who had access to the phone could be the most important. That's going to come back again because I'm going to have access to the data sets. AI is the phone now. But the yes, thing is, is, I feel like back to That's what you said. Yeah, but back to what you said before. It's like the relationships with the CEOs is also something that AI is not going to be able to. Like they're exactly. not going to. I feel like the humans still have the edge because they know where the bodies are Agreed. buried. They know the CEOs. They know all that stuff, and so it's sort of taking that and then using these other tools. But that's such a that's I such an important you. point. So, Harry was a, a prop trader, and a prop trader in the old days, you can't do it anymore. Basically, traded stocks for company. He worked at City and did this. So he mm -hmm. he also has a PhD in finance from MIT. So he's like oh, a, wow. a super genius. But he's done practical trading. He uses these tools: natural language processing, uh, large large language models. He gets the asset allocation from this model he had built using these tools. And then he thinks about it. He goes, well, this, the, the model's telling me that I should be all over REITs right now. But REITs are doing terribly because people are concerned about vacancies in cities. So the model doesn't know that. I'm not going to follow that. Yeah. So there won't be yeah, a human yeah. element. Now, whether or not you need a junior analyst to write a three-page earnings report on earnings that have already happened, yep. I don't know. I'm not sure yeah. that that can't be done by type of AI. But yeah. I agree with you, Kristen. The human element... Because like, if you told them, you told me, oh, all your savings, Steve, are going to be managed by AI for the rest of your life. What, what are you talking about? Yeah. No way. So yeah. I agree with you. There will be a human element, but mm -hmm. you don't have the competitive skills to augment that human thing. Like if you don't have Excel, yeah. right, to be able to build, no matter how much institutional knowledge you have, you're going to be oh, 100%. behind everything. And there's yeah. going to be more of a stratification between the haves and have nots, right? You have to Absolutely. have all of that technology working for you to achieve this efficient baseline. And then you have to have the human intellectual creative overlay over it. So, yeah. you know, if you're not at a, at a big enough institution or an institution with access to these resources, you're going to be left in the dust doing these manual quarterly report yeah. updates. At three right, in the right, right, right. You're right. It's a good point. And resources will help the people do this and, and some people won't have the resources to do it. Anyway, I wanted to get that in. No, know, that's such great. Right. Steve, like this I was said, excellent. Person. We're going to have to have you back on, but thank you so much. Before we sign off, can you tell our listeners just a little bit about what you're doing now? And I guess if they sure. wanted to find you, I don't know if you have any social media presence or sure. if you want to leave them with a way to sure. contact sure. you. So let me, let me give you a quick summary of what I'm doing now. I retired from the hedge fund in 21. I'm now occupying my time partially as a hobby farmer. So I live in the Hudson Valley and I have uh, some acreage and I'm, so cool. I have an orchard. Um, I'm going to raise naturally grass fed cattle. I have a cornfield. I, um, I do it as a hobby. I think agriculture is important, obviously. Yep. And I'm um, on the board of a non farm. And a Christmas tree farm, which your daughter decorated. Aww. And we still have the little things in it. Yep. 
Um, I'm on the board of a nonprofit that supports sustainable farming in the Hudson Valley. What is and it that called? Has led, it's called Glenwood Farms. Very cool. And that has led me really from an investment perspective to see how I can be part of what I think will be the inevitable transformation of agriculture in the same way that mobility has been transferred from internal combustion engines to electric cars. I think not the exact same thing, but things are going to happen in agriculture that will change it. And so I'm doing venture capital investing, companies, startups that are trying to find solutions for farmers, for food processors, for consumers that gives them better food in a way that is better for the world and the environment, you know, less soil erosion, less use of fertilizers, less water usage. And then the last thing, I'm, last two things I'm doing, I am a mentor to graduate students at Columbia University, Harry Maminsky's program. I mentor the students there. And like, just like this podcast, I do training. I do Wall Street training, not the type of training you do, Kristen. I do uh, seminars on the buy side, on the sell side, and I coach analysts in how to do a lot of things that we spent the last hour and 10 minutes talking about. An analyst so, capital A. <laughs> yeah, analyst capital A. So there's a variety of things. I'm using some of my sell side experience. I'm trying to pursue an interest in agriculture, both as a hobby farmer, as an investor, and I'm advising students. Wow. That's great. Well, well any you. of our listeners who are doing their own agricultural startups, now you know who to pitch your idea to, to uh, get some venture <laughs> capital behind you. And I do not have, I'm not a big social media person. I guess I'm just too old. I have a, we have a website that will be up soon. It's called interiorlinesadvisory.com. The website will probably be up next week. Oh, yay. And I have an email address at s.haggertyinteriorlines.com. Awesome. Well, we will so put the it. link to your website in our show notes. We are so grateful for cool. you spending your time with us. This was absolutely, absolutely incredible. I've never been so excited about research. Seriously. <laughs> no, thank you so much. I had so a great time. You. Thanks for the very thoughtful questions and comments. And I wish you fantastic luck with this wonderful idea of a podcast. Thank, thank you, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to The Wall Street Skinny. We are more than just a podcast. So follow us on TikTok and Instagram at The Wall Street Skinny. If you're a visual learner, we have content that will help get you up the curve from valuation to Excel to Bond Fundamentals 101. And if you haven't done so already, please subscribe to our YouTube channel where we will be publishing in-depth tutorials on all this and more. 